Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Shall we get started? Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, this session in the past has been called things like state of, or and I hate all of those expressions, so we went with something very generic, town hall, which doesn't really tell you what it is, and that left us a lot of leeway to decide what it is. Uh, Stan and I are going to co-present to you this morning, and we will make every effort to not over talk so that there's a chance for dialogue and for questions from you. Uh, Stan is going to be presenting an update on the implementation of the strategic plan. So I thought I would take the role of maybe providing some context for the work that we're doing and to give you a sense of what I currently see. Uh, I just presented for two days, I was one of, a presenter for two days at a national conference focusing on issues of diversity and inclusion in higher education. And my role there was not the expert by any means, but really trying to help the people who are attending think about how you plan. How do you create a plan? What has to be in a plan? And what I realized when I was in front of this group was that all of us, regardless of where we are in the hierarchy, get, want to get right into the, the details. We have a tendency to focus on the what and the how. And I think it's really important. I think if we sp don't spend enough time asking why, we, we position ourselves in the wrong place. And if we use the metaphor of up is better and down is not as good, we position the bar too low. So I'd like to spend a little time thinking about why this morning. Uh, one of the things that I've heard since I, the other thing I'll say to you is I've been here now this, in my third winter, so this is my sixth semester at Columbia, and so I feel like I've also been here now long enough to have a little bit of a sense of time elapsing and therefore history being created. And so that's a little bit what I want to uh, think about out loud with you today. So one of the great concerns, and I think it's been true here too, whenever new leadership arrives at an institution, is the question, will this person understand who we are and what we've accomplished and how that defines where we're going? In other words, is this a person who has any historical sense of an institution or are they coming in with the mindset that history doesn't, in other words, are they going to be ahistorical? There are a lot of institutional presidents uh, who are very upfront about denying the past. It's a difficult way to build a sense of community because many members in the community were part of some part of that past and it tends to be then a blanket rejection of value. So I want, to think, I want us to think a little bit about who we are today and where we say we're going and where we've been. Now, Columbia College, and by the way, some of you in the audience may be thinking, I know this better than he does, and that's fine, we can talk about that too. Uh, the college that we are today is very much the brainchild of the Alexandrov period of history, right? It's when the college established the South Loop as its home after having been in a number of other locations in the city. It's the period of time that the college made the commitment to become accredited as a liberal arts institution. It's the period of time when the focus on being an institution with a deep mission-based commitment to providing access to those who had been disadvantaged was put forward as a, as a goal of the college. The concept of a sidewalk college, of an urban institution that was porous to the surrounding communities is a concept that arose during that period of time. So, having said just those things, let's look at where we are today. If, if Mike Alexandrov had the vision with his board of trustees to purchase 600 South Michigan, we now, of course, own 21 properties in the South Loop, and in fact, are the, we are the largest institutional landowner in the South Loop. As many of you heard me say, that's not necessarily how we want to be known, but the point of that is that it requires that the city of Chicago pay attention to us because the South Loop is an important, continuing developing part of the city. So let me see if I can remember some of this stuff. So many of you know that when I arrived, in response to the question, why did you choose to come to Columbia College Chicago? One of my responses was, I would never have come here if I didn't believe that the commitment to some version of the liberal arts was real and central to what this college stands for. In other words, if I had believed that Columbia College Chicago was what it seemed to be saying to the world it was, which is 
an arts and media school, I wouldn't have come here. So again, I, I just say that because a lot of the work that is being done now at various levels of curricular development has to do with the question, what are the optimal learning outcomes for all of our students that come through what we call our core curriculum, which essentially is you know, many important parts of what you would find in a liberal arts college. And then, how are we going to redevelop, reinvigorate, reinvent that core to guarantee that all of our students achieve those outcomes? I'm saying that today because I want you to know that's not an original idea with the Kim administration. This is something that was planted many, many, many years ago. We're just trying to take it to the next level, which of course is the responsibility of leadership. Um, this idea of access, which continues to be a huge part of the college. So I, I know in the past two and a half years, there's been sometimes a little bit of discomfort with the idea that, oh, you know, we're, we're not what we used to be. We're not an open admissions institution anymore. We're becoming selective. So I just want to put out there again, the link to the past. In the 1970s, there was a completely different funding landscape available to young people in this country who wished to go to college. Both proportionately, federal loans that were available were more generous. Additionally, there was an entire sector of the world that was offering private loans to students. That's completely gone away. And as we know, while everything goes up, loans have not gone up for students. So the idea of maintaining the same commitment that this college had in the 70s today is actually would mean we were adopting the policy of we don't really care whether we are potentially inflicting financial harm on students. We just want to say to the world that we let everybody in. So the shift is not we no longer want to be a school that cares about those who have not been given opportunity. We're trying to do it in a responsible manner. So if you look at our admission statistics, we admit approximately 89% of students who apply to us. So let's just be clear that in the world of higher education, that is not a selective institution, right? And it's not something we aspire to be. Why? Because of what I consider Mike Alexandrov's greatest, greatest accomplishment for this college, which was the sentence in the mission that you've heard me talk about over and over again. The idea that we are an institution that prepares our students to become authors of the culture of their times. That statement still, for me, remains one of the noblest, loftiest statements of educational mission that I've ever heard. And I tell you that when I travel around the country talking about Columbia to people who don't know us, when I say that sentence, particularly to educators, inevitably, People gasp. They, you hear it every time, it's like. So if you think about that, the idea of preparing young people essentially to create, to create and own the future, to innovate into the future, then, you, then the access piece of our mission now becomes clear because we don't know the future. None of us knows the future. We may like to think we do, but we don't. The idea of creating culture means we are preparing for something which is undetermined. And in that context, we cannot be glib about thinking that we know which are the students that are the most qualified, are the best somehow, to be part of that process. We don't know which individual brings that one new idea or that one necessary experience to be a spark, to be a catalyst, to allow a community of young people to begin the process of envisioning and developing the skills to create the future. So this is very important to me, to make sure that you understand that in terms of my sense of the college, this commitment to keeping the doors as open as we can while being responsible to students so that we don't end up burdening them in an unconscionable manner is directly related to the mission of the college. And therefore, at least as long as I'm here, it's not going away. I mean, one of the things that I was looking for when I came to 
when I was being cross-examined by the college, because that's what it is really, right? Um, I had this theory in interviews of looking for the red flag. So basically, my idea, this may be helpful as some of you are examining people or involved in searches as members of committees, I always go into a situation having predetermined what I think a red flag looks like. And the red flag for me is, if I find it, I'm done. The red flag for me at Columbia College Chicago was, does this place secretly want to become an elite institution? I probed like crazy. I tried all kinds of different ways to get at that question. And what I came away with was a very profound sense of, no, actually it doesn't. Which is why I took my cue and in the document that I wrote in my first year and then in the naming of the strategic plan, we're using the word greatness because I want the world to understand that we have the guts as an institution to say, we're gonna be a school that shows you that you can be great without being elite. That's fundamental to what I believe and to what I believe this college stands for. Okay, so I have these little words on this card just so you can. Um, now, so to transition into the present at the risk of repeating myself, I just want to remind everyone what I think I was really explicit about seeing when I first got here, which was a place whose value was blazingly apparent, trapped in a level of operational dysfunction that was causing the value to bleed away. That's what I saw. So really quickly, you know, KWK year one, trying desperately to understand what is this place and how does it work, while simultaneously trying to bring a different kind of leadership to the institution. Leadership that was, first of all, com completely committed to what this school is about, but that brought deep experience in higher education so that we could really have a higher ed conversation. I'm saying that because when I first arrived, I kept hearing things that made it sound like people were, not, not you within the community, but many people seem to talk about us as if we are somehow sometimes higher education, sometimes cultural organization, sometimes, it wasn't clear. So I felt it was very important to make sure that across the board there was leadership that really got higher education because we needed to get back to our purpose, which is the education of our students in such a manner that we, are tr that we guarantee the likelihood, the great likelihood, that they will be successful in the world. The poorest idea I'm gonna come back to because I have some ideas, but this idea of sidewalk college is something I love. The idea that we are on the ground in a community looking outwards clearly and the world looking inwards clearly. We're not there yet, by the way, but it's a great, great idea. Okay, um, second year, the goal, KWK's goal was to try to coalesce the community around a vision that pushed us, not an arbitrary vision. So that's why I started a little bit with my version of some of the accomplishments in the Alexandrov era of this college. Everything in the strategic plan has a link backwards as well as a push forwards, everything. If you look at our strategic plan carefully, which you'll be hearing a lot more about, the primary focus is curriculum and achieving student success. So, let, let me just talk a little bit about that. The reason why we're talking about curriculum so much is that if we're here to guarantee that the students who are here, which is a different kind of student, right? A student that is oriented towards creative practice, a student that is determined to develop an authentic voice and is willing to take the risk that goes along with that search for authenticity. We have to make sure that what they are learning is linking them to what's really going on or what we believe is likely to be going on. In other words, we have to make sure that the, the outcomes are placed securely in the larger world and in the, pr in the future, actually. That's the work that's going on right now. That guarantee of success to these students is not something, again, that we invented. It's a continuation of what this college has always stood for. But I will tell you that I think there may have been periods of time, historically, when because the college had achieved so much, 
maybe there was a little bit of stepping back and getting a little too comfortable. Having established a reputation for quality and innovation, maybe there were periods of time where people said, well, now we're there. But of course, there keeps moving. There are need necessary developments in linking this college to more professional opportunity. First, just in the city of Chicago, where we have fallen behind. And we have to look at that. And that's what this curricular re revising process is about. The student piece, this has always been a place, this has always been a teaching institution. And unfortunately, in the world of American higher education, for some people, that sounds like a lower level, right? You say, oh, teaching institution, not a research institution. By the definitions of higher education, we are not a research institution. That does not mean our faculty are not doing important research. What it means is the primary focus, the primary financial model is not based on faculty bringing in grants to the institution. So as a dean at a Carnegie Research One institution, I can tell you that's a very different model. That's a model where the teaching of undergrads is a necessary inconvenience, right? But because tuition funds all institutions, you want as many of them as possible. And so in most research institutions, you very rarely hear people talking about students except to tell you how many there are. We are a teaching institution. We have always been a teaching institution. We always will be a teaching institution. Again, that is not to deny the quality and depth of research and creative exploration that characterizes this place. Okay, so teaching institution, love our students, we all do, but how are we guaranteeing their success? Well, part of it is the curriculum and the clarity of outcomes, but there are other pieces that we have to keep working on. For example, many of our fields at Columbia point straight to either existing or likely to be professions. So then the question becomes, so are we giving students an opportunity to test the waters multiple times before they enter those professions? In some parts of this college, the answer has always been absolutely. But actually, it's not consistent across the college. We don't have right now a sort of a college-wide conversation about the importance and necessity of internships and practicums and other forms of pre-professional experience. The structure that we have privileges some areas and disadvantages other areas. It does one other thing which is even worse. It makes it next to impossible for someone who doesn't know us on the outside to contact us and even give us an opportunity that they have in their hands. I cannot tell you how many times, each time, every time I hear it, my blood pressure number goes a little bit higher. I've been told by many employers in this city, something like, I wanted one of your students, so I started with you. Called the college, got transferred once, got transferred twice. It usually goes up to four or five times. He said, and then I just gave up. So I called Loyola, or I called DePaul, or even I called Roosevelt, where there's one person in charge, and I got a student. So shame on us. Here we're saying to the world that we're all about guaranteeing student success, and we make it difficult for people to give us opportunities for our students. That's changing. The other thing that probably has changed, maybe, one, this is something I want us all to think about. 40, 50 years ago, when we were talking about access to higher education, the value proposition was access. Partly because of the financial climate, and institutions celebrated how many people came in the front door, and who they were, what they looked like. Right? That's not good enough. You cannot define success only by who comes in. You've got to ask who's finishing. So I, I remember that when I first started defining student success in part as completion, it, it actually made some people in our college uncomfortable because the question came back, does he not understand that there's more to, to college than just graduating? Hello, of course I do. But we can't, we can't pat ourselves on the back because students started with us. 
And if you start looking at it that way, if you start asking the question, how many are completing? It begs a whole host of questions about how student-centric is this institution actually? How well have we developed systems that allow students to navigate this college easily and achieve their desired goals? And what we're finding is there are a lot of obstacles. So that's all work we're doing. Again, not invented by us. His, the historical mission of this place. Okay. There's just a few things I want to dream out loud about for you in terms of where I think we're going. Um, and then I'm going to stop because I'd really like Stan to talk about the details of what's happening right now. All right. <clears throat> the idea of a porous college, right? A, a sidewalk college. Many of you have heard me talk about my theories, really, of community engagement. I'm not going to do that this morning. But I have two dreams in this area. I, would, I envision a college, this college, getting to the point where as a part, as a part of their educational experience, not as an add-on, but built into the curriculum, every student at this college is learning in part experientially in community. Do I know what that means? Not really. But here's why I think it's important as a dream. Part of a young person having the wherewithal to navigate the world with an attitude of success is a deep self-awareness. Understanding, who am I really? What is actually important to me and why? Why does my work or my opinion or my voice matter and how do I know? All of us who are educators hope that in our interactions with students, we're helping them achieve that authentic awareness. But I think we also know, without the interaction in the larger world, it may not go deep enough. So that's my sort of theoretical idea about communication. I have a very specific dream. I left Chicago in 1975 to go to college, and although my sister is, has never left the city, so I've been here, of course, through all those years, um, I only moved back for Columbia College Chicago. Coming back to Chicago two and a half years ago, two big surprises. One was pleasant, one was very unhappy. The pleasant experience is how much it felt like home. I did not expect that at all because I hadn't lived here for such a long time. The unhappiness had to do with my, this is just one person's perception. The racial divide that characterized Chicago in the mid 70s is worse today. That's my personal opinion. So I've been thinking about this, right? I just got through telling you that we have to stay focused on higher education. We can't pretend that we're a social service agency. But at the same time, given who we are and what we stand for and who our students are, I've been asking myself, what can Columbia do about this? So one of my dreams is the idea that we create a program that's related to this idea of community engagement where some of our students are learning what it means to use their creative ability to go back into community and be community, not organizers, community knitters. Young people whose commitment is to finding ways to act, reactivate communities that are split. Usually when we talk about community organizers and community development, it's always talking about economics. And trust me, I understand that without jobs, without hope, it's, there's no likelihood of a community rebuilding. But it, we also know there's more to our existence. There's the daily human reality of living where we live. And I think that's where some of our students could really become leaders in our city. So that's one of my dreams. Another dream, I'm not asking anyone to do anything extra right now, don't worry, it's just a dream. Uh, another dream has to do with a conceptual space that I think we're uniquely positioned almost to be part of. So for a number of years now, there's been kind of lots of national experiments with the idea of the arts and technology, the arts and science. I was very involved when I was a dean uh, in that national conversation. In fact, I was one of the co-founders of a national alliance of research institutions that was trying to develop a national agenda for the arts and science sort of mirroring the STEM agenda. Because unlike some people, I reject the idea that turning STEM into STEAM is a big deal. 
you know, some of you, you know, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, there are people, there are advocates who say, oh, we should let, add the letter A for arts and make it STEAM. My argument against that is that still says to the world that the methodologies, that the thinking, that the processes that characterize science, technology, engineering, and math are primary. And we should be grateful for getting a letter stuck into that agenda, right? Sorry, that's not good enough. So we were talking about this. This is one of my dreams for Columbia. Now, the challenge is we don't have here, right, an engineering school or a school of computer science. Or, so in order to enter into that space, we would have to figure out how do we create deep, sustainable partnerships with other programs where the common meeting point is a desire to explore this conceptual space. I think it's a critically important area, and actually, I think many of our students are yearning for a little bit more work in that direction. Now, I will tell you, the, the traditional weak paradigm of this partnership, let's just call it arts and science, is like this. So science someone uh, is working on a complicated research project that nobody understands. So they expect someone in the arts to come and essentially illustrate the data in a way that's more understand. That's not a partnership. That's not a partnership. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is some, some form of true interdisciplinarity where we're, we're saying from different disciplinary perspectives, individuals understand the world profoundly differently. And there's something in the way those different understandings merge and create an understanding that neither is capable of achieving on their own. Again, very conceptual. I just think the world is moving in this direction. We've got the talent here. We've got, we just don't have certain programs here. Let me see what else did I want to tell you. Oh, just one last area, one last area. This, I'm so sure about this, especially, I mean, and my surety has been reinforced by this experience at this conference. So the conversation about diversity and inclusion, or diversity, equity, and inclusion, there's lots of ways, lots of labels for it, um, is we're starting in a different place than any other institution that I'm familiar with, in that we're actually saying, oh no, it's essential to our mission, which means it has to be embedded throughout the institution. So, we're not having the quota conversation. Um, and what we recognize here is that at least the word diversity and inclusion always have to be said at the same time. Because diversity just means difference. So you could be, an ex we could be, an extremely diverse institution where only the same people were always privileged. Inclusion means a, is, a, is a system, is a, is a model where one strives to welcome all voices and perspectives. But as I said at this conference, that doesn't guarantee any kind of diversity. I would guess that the Aryan nation is highly inclusive, right? So they have to go together. They have to go together. What I've sensed at Columbia is there's a courage here. So let me tell you one thing I asked this group at this conference. I wish you could all have seen it because they all, they all just kind of sat back and their eyes got to perfect you know, comic book circles. I said, I want everyone in this room to deal with this question. Can a white, heterosexual, middle-aged, able-bodied man lead diversity and inclusion work? People got really uncomfortable by that question. I said, now you know what this work is about. It's about being uncomfortable and asking tough questions that force us to confront things that a lot of times we'd just rather not deal with. But that's happening here. And I really believe in the future, this is my third dream, we're gonna be known for this. That when people look at our curriculum, when they look at our policies, when they look at our stance towards the world, one of the things they're gonna see is a school that got this right. And let me tell you, if there's an area that is critically important that we get right, it's this. I know I said this to this, a similar body last semester, but I think we have the courage here as a community to confront the fact that at the core of this conversation is a conversation about racism, while understanding that it goes far beyond that. So anyway, 
Thank you for your attention this morning. Those are my kind of, that's my brief survey. And just a couple ideas I have that I would love us to begin considering when it's the time to consider them. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Kim has asked me to speak briefly about strategic plan implementation. I just want to remind you about the process that we went through last year. Many of you, if not all of you, were involved in that in one way or another. Uh, we started with an extraction from Dr. Kim's white paper of six strategic goals. We formed a strategic planning committee with six subcommittees, one for each goal. And then we used as inclusive a process as we could to try to gather feedback from all of you from all of our students, from all of our staff, from all of our faculty, from anyone who wanted to participate, from alumni, from members of the community, using a social media platform as well as a number of public forums to gather as much data as we could about your views on where we needed to go strategically in the future. We then aggregated all those data, analyzed the data, and created the strategic plan that you've seen. I think it's an ambitious strategic plan, a plan that we can all be very proud of, and a plan that really will move us into the future in very positive ways. Now, having a strategic plan doesn't mean that things were badly broken here. It just means that we're trying to be systemic and systematic in the way we think about where we're going. And it means that we're trying to move ourselves together jointly in the same direction. I've said before that the road can be very broad, but we all need to end up at the same destination, and that's really the point of the strategic plan. So we have what I think is a profoundly good strategic plan, and you know, I used a similar uh, method, as I told you, at my prior institution um, when I was charged with leading the academic strategic planning process. And at that time, that university set a record with the social media platform, the Civic Commons, a record for engagement. We actually broke that record by a factor of five, which is a remarkable piece of evidence about what an engaged community this is. And in fact, one Sunday, we literally broke the social media site, and they were scrambling to repair it because there were so many people who were trying to participate. So this really comes down to two things, and this is what we're working on this year, academic quality and the student experience. Now again, this is not to say that our academic quality is bad or that the student experience is bad. However, we do know some things. We know, for example, that after an explosive period of enrollment growth, with the recession of 2008, we began to steadily lose enrollment. Now there are a number of reasons for this. Some of these have to do with the private loan market, um, the shrinking of Pell Grants, the shrinking of the MAP Grant from the state of Illinois, but we also know from Royal Dawson's data that we were beginning to look less attractive to prospective students. Another thing that we know about both our academic quality and our student experience is that our six-year graduation rate is about 10 points below the national average. And that's something that we should all be somewhat alarmed about, particularly because this is a, te a teaching institution. I mean, it's the teaching institutions that typically have the best six-year graduation rate. So we need to be asking ourselves, why is this happening? Again, we know from Royal Dawson's data, and he looks at prospective students, he looks at students who are admitted and don't come here, he looks at the freshman class, he looks at our graduates, he looks at a number of different data sets. And he's found uniformly that there are some concerns about both of these things, the, the academic quality of, of the institution, and the student experience at the institution. So that's why we're working on those. And as Dr. Kim said, I think we went through a period here of real dedication to innovation, but perhaps we did become complacent when our enrollment hit 12,000. Um, maybe we thought we had it right. And the reality in higher education is that you never have it right. I mean, we should be constantly looking for ways to improve who we are and what we do. And that's what this process is about as well. So there are two ways of looking at academic quality. One is people's perceptions of academic quality. And one of the things that I've heard many times since coming here is that Columbia College Chicago is one of the best kept secrets in the city of Chicago. And my attitude is, why should we keep it a secret? 
Let's tell our story. Let's get it out there. So as you know, Deb Maui, our new uh, Vice President for Strategic Marketing and Communication, has been working with Ology, a company from Columbus, Ohio, on the college's brand so that we have a consistent brand message that we tell, a consistent narrative that we tell about ourselves and our greatness as an institution. And then she's also working on incorporating that brand into all of our communications so that there is this consistent message and it is a message about quality. Uh, I have the privilege of serving with a number of you, staff, faculty, administrators, students, on the branding committee and I've seen the Ology's first draft of this. They've got a couple of different versions. It's very exciting. Uh, right now they're market testing this with students and prospective students and then they'll come back to us with further advice in the future. But we also need to work on the actual academic quality and that's where my efforts have been primary this year and where many of you have been engaged as well. You know that we have a number of strategic plan implementation committees. Many of you in this room are on those committees. They consist of faculty, staff, students, um, and we're trying to move forward on a number of fronts simultaneously. So one of the things that we worked on in the fall semester was to develop a set of universal learning outcomes. And a draft of those outcomes was released on December 15th as promised. Those are now in the hands of all the department chairs. So all of you should have an opportunity as the semester begins to have a departmental level conversation about these proposed learning outcomes. And we're asking you to respond to two questions about these. One is, is there anything in these outcomes that just doesn't make sense to you? And the other is, what's missing? And so we hope that you'll provide us feedback on both of those things so that we can revise these outcomes and then put them into effect. I want to say that this is not an exercise in college-wide editing of the learning outcomes because we could spend the rest of our lives trying to find consensus on precisely what the language should be. So it's really looking at the intent behind them, the, the things that we say are characteristic of our education here. Do they make sense to you and are there things missing from them? These will inform and have already begun to inform the conversation about the core curriculum and the conversation about revisions to major curricula. So the next piece is a revision to the core. Again, you know, actually one of the things that I found very appealing about Columbia before I came here was a very unique, interesting core that is very much connected to the fact that this is a college that is primarily about arts, performing arts, and media. However, as we all know, the core is what we refer to now as the LAS core. Now, I want to tell you that I'm a product of a liber liberal arts education and I am a, a deep believer in the value of a liberal arts education. But we fool ourselves if we think that all the core knowledge that our students need to possess is somehow contained and owned by the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences. So while that school will still play a primary role in the core, we want to expand the core to make sure that other schools, other departments, also have an opportunity to, to participate in it. And we want to make it a core that is very, uh, very much, very deeply connected to who we are as an institution, to our mission um, and to our majors here. So for example, at a place like this, why isn't embodied practice part of the core curriculum? That's not something that you're likely to see coming out of the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences as much as you might see coming out of the dance department and the theater department. So we need to find ways to get other departments into the core as well. Now, another interesting thing about Columbia is that unlike most institutions where a lot of students are in professional majors, and I came from an institution like that, uh, where there are nursing majors and engineering majors and computer science majors and psychology majors, we have arts and performing arts majors and media majors. So unless we make some intentional effort to do so, there's a danger that our students will graduate without the knowledge they need of business, of marketing, particularly ways in which they can market themselves as performers, as artists in the world, knowledge of entrepreneurship, and knowledge of the impact of technology on our careers and on our society. So we want to see that in the core as well. Dr. Kim talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion. This is a place that is extraordinarily diverse, yet in many ways we don't own that 
fact about ourselves and really embed that in our curriculum. So that needs to be much more strongly embedded in the core. And then finally, here we are in the South Loop, and many of you have powerful connections to the community, but institutionally, we do not have that community connection. And we don't have systematic ways of making sure that every student at Columbia College Chicago has that opportunity to engage deeply in the city of Chicago to learn about the city, to learn about themselves and their artistic practice by intersecting with the city, and to participate in an act of mutual transformation with the community. So we hope to see that in the core as well. We're also, as you know, working on revising the required first semester course. We had a first semester seminar, first year seminar. There was much that was good about it, but there were a number of issues with it that had not been addressed. So we have underway, as you know, something that has come to be known as the Big Chicago Courses. It's a name I don't particularly like, and I hope that we can come up with a better name for these. But these are lecture courses taught by some of our very best faculty that then divide up into smaller sections led by graduate teaching assistants that go out and do that engagement in the city of Chicago. We have now the data back from that. We assessed that all last semester. We had focus groups, we had questionnaires, and we did an end of the semester assessment as well. So we know a lot now about what worked and what didn't work, and we're going to be revising that. One thing I can tell you definitely is that while there were concerns about the fact that these were large lecture classes, and historically that's not what we've done here, the students actually enjoyed the lecture classes. And the more the small group community outreach worked, the more they enjoyed the lecture classes. Those things really went hand in hand. And there were some really powerfully effective classes that were offered, and now we have the opportunity to improve those in the future. We're also engaged right now in a process of revising all our programmatic curricula, all our major curricula, all, all of our minor curricula. This is a huge effort. I believe it's unprecedented in the history of Columbia College Chicago, and it's very rare to see an institution that has the courage to do something like this. But we know, and we knew as we were participating in the strategic planning process, that we need to make sure that our curricula are relevant in the 21st century, that our curricula are preparing students for employment, and I'm not saying jobs, but I'm saying employment over the course of their lives, that our curricula are engaging them with the city, and that our curricula are connected to some set of learning outcomes. Um, we had two one-day workshops last week with all deans, associate deans, chairs, and associate chairs. Today, we have a national leader in curriculum development, Paul Gaston, who's sitting right here in the audience, who will be leading that group along with the um, core curriculum committee, the Universal Learning Outcomes Committee, the Executive Committee of Faculty Senate, and the Academic Affairs Committee of Faculty Senate in a day-long workshop on curriculum development. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, why can't I be there? Well, for one thing, we don't have a room that big at Columbia College Chicago. But for another thing, what we decided was to get the people who are involved in curriculum approval in this room. All of you who want to be involved in curriculum design will have that opportunity at the departmental level to engage in conversation about what our curriculum should look like. We're also trying to streamline our majors and develop clear four-year roadmaps. A lot of our majors are unclear to our students. This is another thing that we know from survey feedback. Um, and we have curriculum that I would have to say the, the intentions are good. The intentions are to give students a lot of choice. But in some cases, we've get, given students so much choice that they're actually the curriculum designers. And students come here for our expertise. They don't have expertise in curriculum. Now, they do want some choice, obviously, and we need to give them some choice. We need to give them the opportunity to explore. But when you have programs where there's a core of nine or 12 credits and everything else is take electives in the major in addition to your college-wide electives, that's not enough structure for students, and they get lost, and then they don't graduate. So we're trying to streamline curriculum to make sure that it moves students in 
an identifiable way toward graduation, which really should be our goal for all of our students. I mean, if, if we're not graduating a student, that's a failure on our part. Really, success for us as an institution is every student we are able to graduate and send out into the world as an adult who's really ready to engage with that world. We're also working on creation of some online professional master's programs. As you know, we have a search underway for a vice provost for online education. We are very much behind the rest of the nation in offering online programs. The good news is we can learn from mistakes that other institutions made. We have an extraordinary pool of candidates um, for this vice provost position. And this will begin to transform our graduate studies in many ways. Um, by the way, we also will continue to work on growing our face-to-face -face graduate study. Um, but it also will bring in new revenue streams that will allow us to do many of the things that we hope to do in strategic plan implementation. Um, we are in the process of creating a continuing education program, and we plan to have four new, new offerings by this summer. Again, this is something that we have not done in a systematic way. We've done a little bit of it, that different departments do their own thing, but we haven't done this as an institutional thing. This is a way to, again, engage the community, bring what we have to offer to the adult professional community of, of Chicago, and bring in new revenue streams. And then we're working on creating one new, broadly appealing major. We've talked, for example, about a communication major. Um, a major like this not only can attract a lot of different kinds of students, but these kinds of majors also are great retention majors, so that if students find that they're not happy in the major they came into, um, communication, and that's just one example, um, can be a good major to transfer into. When I was a dean, I was a dean of a college of communication and information. My school of communication studies had the smallest freshman class every year in my college. It had the largest graduating class every year in my college because so many students from around the institution became communication majors when they found that they weren't happy with whatever their starting majors were. So we need something like that as a way of retaining students. The student experience. One of the first things we'll be doing beginning in the fall is changing from a faculty advising model to a professional advising model, a model that is intrusive, which is to mean that students will be required to see an advisor before they register every semester. We'll begin with the freshman class. The following year, it will be freshmen and sophomores and so forth until all of the students are involved. We know from national experience that professional advising works for retention and it works for graduation. Faculty are extremely busy. They have their teaching agendas, their creative agendas, their research agendas. They don't have the time to know the entire curriculum of the institution. They're well-intentioned. But what we hope to do with faculty is move them instead into a mentoring program, which is what faculty do best in their interactions with students. So the difference is this. When I talk about advising in this context, I'm talking about what do I register for next semester or the semester after that? How do I declare a major? Uh, how do I apply for graduation? How do I change majors? All of those kinds of technical details that are better handled by a professional staff. Mentoring is what kind of an internship should I get? Do you think this is the right major for me? What can you do if you're a theater major and you don't get into an acting career? Those are the kinds of things that faculty do extraordinarily well that are very much connected to their teaching. And it's a better use of faculty time than having faculty try to memorize the whole curriculum of the institution and then give this technical advice on registration, uh, change of major, all of those kinds of things. And then we're also creating a coordinated concierge model for admitted students. Right now, if you're an admitted student, you call one place about your admission, another place about housing, another place about student financial services, another place about orientation, another place about registration. We're trying to pull this all together into a concierge model where a student can call one phone number or email one address and get all of that information from the person they talk to there. We have a problem here with yield, which means that students are admitted and then they don't show up. We have a problem here with something called melt, which means that students go so far as to pay their deposit and then they don't show up. They're willing to forfeit that deposit. Our melt rate is 18%.
we should be in about the 11% range. And we believe that this concierge model will be one thing we can do to help with that. Uh, we're creating a career center, and this is under Mark Kelly's leadership. I saw Mark just a minute ago somewhere in here. Anyway, this is under Mark Kelly's leadership. Um, this is something Dr. Kim talked about before, uh, making sure that there's one place for the professionals, performers, and so forth in the Chicago community to call to get an intern from Columbia College Chicago, but also one place that coordinates our internship activities and our career placement activities and our career readiness activities and our, our professional portfolio activities. Departments, of course, will continue to be deeply involved in this, and de each department will have a liaison to the career center. Uh, four credit internships will, will still be very much under the control of the departments, but this will streamline things for our students and for the professional community. The number of students in internships at Columbia has actually been dropping in recent years, not growing. And this is an opportunity to begin ensuring that, it, I think, all of our students get the opportunity for an internship before they graduate from Columbia College Chicago. We're also expanding partnerships with two-year institutions. Much of the future of baccalaureate level higher education is wrapped up in partnerships with community colleges. Students are becoming much more price conscious they're going to community colleges for the first two years, and they want to find baccalaureate institutions where there are clear articulation pathways into majors so that everything they, they do at community college counts toward their completion of a bachelor's degree. There are efforts, as you know, nationally to make community college education free for all students. So we have to be poised to be a cooperative partner for transfer students. Let me say another thing about community college students. When I was younger, these were called junior colleges, and implicit in the word junior was that they were somehow less than a baccalaureate institution. You went to a junior college if you couldn't be admitted to a baccalaureate institution to improve your grades and your study habits so that you could get into a four-year institution. That's not the case anymore. Our six-year graduation rate is 20 points higher among our transfer students from community colleges than it is among the students who start here as first-time freshmen. These are students who are prepared, who are focused, who want to earn a degree. These are the kinds of students you want in your classrooms. And the work that Carrie uh, Walters is doing to improve these partnerships is going to improve Columbia College Chicago as well and improve the experience for all of us. So improving transfer students. Um, as you know, we have program planning underway for a new student center. This has been extraordinarily heartening to me to hear the student engagement in this program planning because at a lot of institutions, it would be the, the student comments would be about having a McDonald's, having a climbing wall, um, having a Starbucks, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But what our, st our students had to be reminded about those things. What they've asked for in the program planning is collaborative spaces, rooms with technology, rooms where they can have meetings, rooms where they can meet with students from other majors. I mean, our students here are so focused on their creative activities, they're not thinking about recreation. They're thinking about yet another opportunity to collaborate with each other. And so I think we're going to have a very exciting student center that's going to be quite unlike student centers at other institutions. In relation to this, we're also refocusing our common and presenting spaces to better support students, including this room itself. So this will become part of the college-wide common spaces. It will still be available for the same curricular purposes it always has been. But now this can be a room where students can showcase their films, for example. Gallery spaces will be spaces not only where we can have professional exhibits that are deeply connected to the curriculum, but also where students can exhibit their body of work over the course of time here. There are many students who never exhibit their work before manifest. And this is an opportunity for students to exhibit in their sophomore, junior, senior years, and so forth. And it's connected to this movement toward a student center in the future. So you know we've had these committees, the Universal Learning Outcomes Committee, 
the Columbia Core Committee, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, which just uh, was announced, the Community Engagement Committee, the Integrated First Year Experience Committee, and the Registration and New Student Orient Orientation Committee. All of these committees are working on these issues of academic quality, improving it, and improving the student experience. All of these committees consist of faculty, both full-time and part-time, staff, and students. And all of these committees are doing extraordinary work in moving this agenda forward. Um, in terms of curricular design, we've done employer focus groups. We're looking at national employer data sets to try to get a sense of, am I running out of time? Okay. To try to get a sense of what employers are looking for in college graduates. We're also forming advisory boards of employers of Columbia College Chicago students so that we have that outside perspective in curriculum design. All department schools, vice presidents, deans have completed their implementation plans and the departments, as you know, are working on revising program level learning outcomes, reimagining major curricula, we're doing these three full days of curriculum workshops and creating the clear four-year roadmaps. So I think that's about all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time this morning.